Welcome to Bedford Presbyterian Church. It is wonderful to worship with you, even though we cannot be together in body, it's good to be together in spirit. Our stewardship season continues. If you haven't had a chance to fill out that pledge card, please do. We would love to have it come in before Sunday, November 22nd, so we can put together our budget. We've heard from so many of you and we just are overcome by your generosity. Thank you. And we look forward to talking with more of you. Also coming up today after the service, there will be a food drive between 11 a.m. and 1 o'clock p.m. It's for the Mount Kisco Interfaith Food Pantry, and this is a chance for us to give uh, for Thanksgiving dinner program. It's a chance for us to be able to reach out and share our tables together. If you want to know what they need, there is a list provided on a link in your e-news. We will be joining together for the virtual Thanksgiving service on Sunday, November 22nd at 4 o'clock p.m. It will be our regular annual Thanksgiving service. We'll be joining Antioch Baptist Church in Chempel Shri Tefila. And this time, though, we will be having it virtually. So watch your evening, and we will make sure that we give you the link for that. We want to remind you as well that we will not be having a mistletoe mart this year. Unfortunately, we just didn't feel like it was a safe time to have it this year, especially with the COVID numbers increasing. But if you would like to uh, have some input, you can um, contact Judy Newton for that. Again, the information is in the e-news. On November 22nd as well, we wanna to join together for a congregational meeting. This isn't an official meeting. We don't have any official business on this congregational meeting, but this will be a time when we can answer and ask some questions. I know there have been a lot of questions about when will the building be open? When can we use it? What's happening for the holidays? Why are decisions being made and why are some not being made? And so we want to have this opportunity for you to come with your questions. We'll also be sending out a survey around some of these issues as well so we can get your feedback. We'll talk about the answers from that survey, and we'll discuss um, some of our logic and our, our thoughts behind what we're deciding here at uh, Bedford Presbyterian Church. That is all of our announcements for today. So let us turn our hearts and minds to worship God. place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth before you formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting you are God for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past so teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart let us worship God
Good morning. In my decades on this planet, I've been called many things, but biblical scholar, biblical scholar has never been one of them. Please keep that disclaimer in mind as I present our Hebrew Bible lesson for this morning. Many of the Bible lessons that I grew up with and that we were all familiar with involve people to people encounters, stories like the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son. In contrast, this lesson from the book of Judges, chapter four, reads more like a history lesson with an overlay of a military battle plan. And it contains more than a dozen mostly unfamiliar ancient names and locations that are somewhat of a challenge to keep straight as the story unfolds. It just might take a second or third reading to sort out the essence of the plot. I'm optimistic that Reverend Carroll will share some insights that will pull this all together. So, without further ado, Judges chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. We don't know what they did, but it was evil. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan who reigned in Hazor, the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he, commander Sisera, had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Libadoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the, under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, familiar name, son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go! Take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulon. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And I will give him into your hand. This is our Hebrew Bible lesson for today. Today's gospel lesson is from the 25th chapter of Matthew, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trusty slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, 
I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would receive what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even when they have, all will be taken away. As for this worthy slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I was in Tennessee. I was serving a church as a part-time designated pastor for a congregation that had split over marriage equality. They had just watched all of their big donors walk out of the door, and they were left with a building and no way to pay for it. So they decided to do something interesting. They decided to start feeding their community. They began serving breakfasts on Sunday morning and dinners on Wednesday nights. They started a food pantry and eventually they were serving over half of the population of their town. One time I was sitting at my desk and I heard the director of the food pantry start howling with joy. I asked her what in the world was going on and she said, I just put in a food order that we could not pay for. And then I came upstairs, I got the mail, and I opened up an envelope, and we got a grant that covers it. I shook my head. I reprimanded her for spending money that we didn't have. And she just shrugged and said, that's how she always does it, and it always works out. God always provides. It's really interesting to watch how churches react to money. One church I served had an endowment with over $10 million. I was there in 2007 and in 2008 when the stock market crashed, and they constantly talked about how they were going to have to close their doors because they just didn't have enough money. Of course, they still had millions of dollars in the bank, but our session meetings were consumed with discussions about how they had to fire staff, cut back on their ministries, lower their mission budget, because there was no way they were going to survive. They would surely close within the next few years. They were by far the richest church I've ever served but they talked like the poorest. I also served an African-American church in the projects, and they had an annual budget of $16,000. They provided a full Christmas, gifts and food and everything to every child in their neighborhood who needed it. They also talked about closing, and then they would shrug and just keep on going. <laughs> Serving different areas of the country with vastly different resources made me realize that it's almost never about the dollar amount in the bank that makes us happy or fulfilled. I mean, of course it does to a point. If a person is struggling to feed themselves and their family, if they're not able to shelter themselves, then it is all about the dollar amount. Your head, your focus, your energy, all you think about is the stress of money. But once that hurdle has been reached, 
It's not about how much we have that gives us life or abundance. It is how that money, however great or however small the amount it is, it's about how it's moving throughout the world. When we have a goal, a calling, a mission in our lives, and we see money as the energy that gets us there, then we can have lives of abundance. When churches come to the table and they put together their budget each year, we often bring so many assumptions with us. Money is a powerful spiritual force, but we can also attach a lot of shame to it. We don't talk about it. Pastors hate talking about money. We're living in a time when there have been so many religious swindlers. Most of us don't want to touch the subject at all. Plus, with our current structure of soaring educational costs and financially struggling churches, it means that most pastors come into the ministry with an unsustainable debt-to-income ratio. They don't feel like they can talk about money. So that means about the only places in our common society that we hear much about money is through bank, credit card, and investment service commercials. And their job is to equate money with success. So we start to glean our wisdom surrounding our resources implicitly. Sometimes our parents or our loved ones manipulate us with money, and we get caught up in transactional relationships. We start to think that money equals love or acceptance. Sometimes when we were growing up, and if we had a lot of resources, people did receive love. And then they later on found out that the person loved them for their money, not for who they actually were. And they felt used and frustrated. Our society often teaches us that our self-worth is dependent on our assets. That lie can have the possibility of leading into a life of joyless and unfulfilling work. It can also turn us into hoarders. And I think that's what Jesus was getting to in this parable. Jesus is trying to warn us against hoarding. The boss gives his workers money. They invest it and turn it into more money. Except for one man. He buries it into the ground. He's afraid. And the boss sternly reprimands him for it. I think what Jesus is telling us is that money should be moving and should be working. I've been very influenced by Lynn Twist, who wrote a book called The Soul of Money. And she talks about money as being like water. You never want water to be stagnant. You want it to flow. You want it to nurture the most people and the highest purpose. And money is the same way. Money is not the goal, it's the energy that gets us to the goal. If we make money the goal of our lives, then we will never have enough of it and we'll be caught in a cycle of scarcity. We will always be grasping for more. In Haiti, they have a saying, that if someone gives you a piece of cake and you eat the whole thing, you will feel empty. But if someone gives you a piece of cake and you share half of it, you will be happy and filled. The important thing is to figure out 
what your purpose and your mission is. What gives you that grounding? What gives you that joy? And when we can use our resources toward that mission, then that is when we move into a life of true abundance. As Jesus also says, when we seek first the reign of God, all of the other things are added to us. So let us go out seeking our calling and using the resources that we have toward it. To the glory of God, our creator, God, our nurturer, and God, our liberator. Amen. My name is Matt Valenti. My family and I have been members of Bedford Presbyterian Church since 2014. For most of my adult spiritual life, these words from you two echoed in my head. And I joined the movement if there was one I could believe in. Yeah, I'd break bread and wine if there was a church I could receive in, because I need it now. Upon finding Bedford Presbyterian Church and experiencing its inclusive welcome, the voice in my head that repeated those lyrics finally rested. As I learned the concept of more than Sundays, I naturally gravitated towards the chili and beer. Making chili for Mistletoe Mart was one of my first BPC involvement outside of Sunday, and I started attending pub theology. Now, while I did not find much theology in those pub theology meetings, I did experience a heavy discourse about social justice within the context of current events. Perhaps most importantly, I found a forum to exchange diverse opinions that were sometimes heated, but I was also getting to know members of my community. And as my connection with the community grew, I started volunteering at the Mount Kisco Food Pantry and started supporting our youth programs like Bible study and confirmation. I even had the privilege to serve on the pastor nominating committee this past summer. I really thank Bedford Presbyterian Church for fostering connections in my community, as well as modeling how to love my neighbor. Which brings us to today and the road ahead. Recently, I was at the Village Green Deli, just down the block from church, and this sign stopped me in my tracks. It seems everywhere we turn, there are signals to speak louder. Masks muffling voices, plastic dividers blocking sound, social distance putting more space between our words, a social climate where the loudest voices get the most attention. It seems everything is telling us to speak louder. But then I read the sign again, particularly the phrase, it's very hard to hear. And it struck me that our challenge is not to speak louder. Our challenge is instead to listen harder. If as Christians, we can turn the other cheek to our enemies, we can certainly turn another ear to our neighbors. And if we cannot differentiate the cacophony around us, then our challenge is to serve others because actions speak louder than words. And this is what excites me to be a part of Bedford Presbyterian Church. First, during the pastor search process, one of the things that impressed me most about Reverend Carol was that of all the candidates, she listened the hardest. She listened intently and actively. And we are so lucky to have her. Second, so much of our identity as a church is outside the building. And while I look forward to when we can reconvene a church, and that will be a happy day, Right now, we are uniquely positioned to meet the challenges of this time because we are more than Sundays. And so for me, that renewed vision gravitates towards the Mount Kisco food, Interfaith Food Pantry for several reasons. First, BPC was a co-founder of this service. It's part of who we are. I love the interfaith component of it. We build on our commonalities, not our differences. And unfortunately, food insecurity is on the rise. The need has never been greater. So I appreciate you listening to my perspective, and I thank you for any support you can provide to BPC during the 2021 stewardship effort. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh God, we praise you 
for your life, your light, and for the richness of the water that flows in and among us. We thank you for the abundance that you have given us, and we ask, O oh God, that you will continue to strengthen us in that abundance. Help it, O oh God, to flow like a mighty river from this church. God, as we think about the new thing that we are doing in this congregation, we ask that you will help us to use our resources in order to get there. We pray that you will continue to help us to act with righteousness and with justice and with mercy, O oh God. We pray today for our nation. As the number of COVID cases climb and as we watch those COVID maps turn red, we ask, O oh God, that you will give people wisdom. We ask that you will continually help us to be able to look after ourselves and our neighbors by using masks and using the best science available. We pray, O oh God, that you will give researchers and lab techs and everyone who needs to be behind getting this pandemic under control, you will give them the courage and sustenance and ability to move forward. We pray for all of those who are in the medical facilities who are tired and exhausted and overwhelmed by the number of patients. We ask that you will strengthen them as well. We pray, oh God, as we go through this transition of power, that it will happen smoothly in our country and that we will be able to heal. And we ask, oh God, that you will continue to strengthen and give us wisdom as Bedford Presbyterian Church. We pray for those who are sick in our own community, those who are suffering from loneliness or despair. And we pray for those in our community who are hungry, who do not have jobs, who are struggling to figure out where their food or their shelter is going to come from. And we ask, O oh God, that you will make us into your hands and your feet to heal this broken world. We ask all of these things in your name and we lift up those things in our hearts in the silence. Oh God, hear our prayers. And now let us pray together as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. John Wesley tells us that we should make all we can, save all we can, so that we can give all we can. Those are wise words for us today. May we use our talents toward God's calling and abundant life. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen.